Hi, Grandma here reading the uh, Golden Goblet, uh, and I'm continuing on channel, uh, chapter five, page 82. Before this, uh, we have found out that uh, Ibni has been fired from the goldsmith, um, and, uh, and Ronifer has uh, seen him and made, managed to avoid him, uh, and now he's headed home. He dawdled on the way home, fighting off wave after wave of dread. When he reached the street of the crooked dog, he found the gate of Gaboo's house open. Torchlight flickered within the courtyard and there was a mumble of voices. Slowly on feet that wanted badly to run the other way, Ronifer walked into the courtyard. The voices belonged to Ibni and Gaboo. They stood together in the middle of the paved space and Gaboo held a torch. He extended it and squinted through its light at Ronifer, but merely grunted without interest when he saw who it was and turned back to Ibni. Nay, nay, you have served me well enough, but you're no use to me now. Can you not see that? You must find some other master. Some other? How will I live? You promised me. I promised you nothing. Come now, be off with you. Gabu started toward the gate, but Ibni, clung to his arm and continued his panic-stricken whine. You did, I, you did, at the wine shop that night when we struck our bargain. You said, I said nothing, I remember. Be off. Gaboo brushed him away with a careless gesture that nevertheless sent him sprawling and strode on past Ronifer to the gate where he looked this way and that along the street holding his torch high. Ask the boy, Ibni cried, apparently catching sight of Ronifer for the first time. Here's the young one, ask him. He scrambled to his feet and darted over to Ronifer with his most obsquicious smile and the hateful hand wringing. You'll help old Ibni, won't you? I'll wager you miss me today and wondered where I was. Well, I've been turned off. I've been accused unfairly of someone else's evil doing. Can I help that? I'm the soul of honor, always have been. I trust people's promises. Tell your honored brother how he promised me a copper a day for life if I would serve him at the gold shop. I know nothing about it, Ronifer muttered, brushing past the Babylonian in his turn. He walked quickly to the storeroom and went inside. There he stood in the darkness, clinging to the gritty edge of a shelf and breathing fast with joy. He could scarcely believe his luck. Obviously, all was well at last. All was better than he had dared hope. Neither Ibni nor Gabu suspected him of any connection with this affair. Gabu was not in a rage. Incredibly, he did not even seem much interested. How could that be? after all the rages and beatings concerning that cursed wineskins. Still, thought Ronifer, the last time I brought the wineskin, he did not seem much interested either. He said to Wetterman, it is of small importance now. Why just then? Nothing had changed that day that Ronifer could remember, except that Gaboo's mood had suddenly altered as it often did, and food had been more plentiful since. He gave it up. What matter was Gabu was not interested. He was waiting for someone, no doubt, Rinneman or the Nile boat captain, and his mind was on something else. Ronifer prayed to Ammon that it might stay there. Groping along the shelf, he found half a bread loaf and several onions. He ate them quickly while the voices went on outside, then dipped a mug of water and drank deep, a sudden roar of anger brought him to the doorway. Gabu had come to the end of his patience with Ibni's whining. Tie that tongue of yours in a basket and throw it in the Nile, he bellowed. You'll get nothing more from me. Get out and don't come back. He gave the Babylonian a push that sent him careening out the gate into the arms of Winneman, who was just coming in. Winneman dropped his unexpected burden sidestepped disdainfully and entered the courtyard. Ah, here you are, Gabu grunted. Ibni picked himself up, was shrilling venomously, 
very well, very well. We'll see how you fare without me. You'll get no one else to do your bidding at Rake the Goldsmiths. The boy won't. No use to ask him. Gaboo closed the gate in his fist. Him and his paltry wineskins. There are far bigger birds in the air than Rake the Goldsmith, eh, my friend? He grinned at Winneman in a slow, sly way that made Ronifer suddenly uneasy, much as he had enjoyed seeing the last of Ibni. Deciding abruptly that what he wished now was the obscurity of his corner, he started for the acacia tree. Gaboo's voice stopped him. You, Ronifer, I'm going out. If any should ask for me, send them to Mutra's wine shop. Gaboo turned away, then turned back. Oh, about tomorrow. You're finished at Rake's. Come to the stone cutting shop at first light in the morning. You're apprenticed to me now. Again, he turned to go, leaving, go, leaving Ronifer too stunned at first to move or even speak. Gaboo was at the gate before he found his voice. Wait, Gaboo, wait. Well, Gaboo grunted, turning. I please, what did you just say now? I said, come to the stone cutting shop. At first light tomorrow, you will start your apprenticeship. But, but you cannot mean that. You cannot mean. I mean what I say, as always, Gabu said, walking on again. Ronifer rushed after him and caught his sleeve. Do you mean I cannot go back to Rakes? Not ever? Oh, please. <sighs> leave off that yowling. But please. Oh, please do not make me leave gold working. I do not want to be a stone cutter. I, silence, get out of the way. But why are you doing this? Why, I have done nothing. Gabu glanced at him impatiently. Did you not hear the Babylonian? It is all over at the goldsmiths. I told you before, I must have some use of you. But I earn Devon at breaks and I bring them all home. Wait, listen to me, please. Let me go to the gold house tomorrow, only tomorrow. Break will expect me, he does not know. Oh, I sent word to him an hour ago. Out of the way now. Come friend, we are late. Pushing Ronifer aside, Gabu opened the gate and raised his torch for Winneman to pass through. Nay, please, please let me go tomorrow, only one more day. I want to make little golden leaves tomorrow. The gate slammed. The torchlight was cut off by the wall. Ronifer dropped to his knees on the pavement and burst into sobs. Later, when the moon had climbed high over the courtyard wall, Gabu came home again. Ronifer was waiting for him, huddled deep in the shadow of the acacia tree. He had rehearsed many times every word he was going to say. Now the time had come. As Gabu bolted the gate behind him and started for the stairs, Ronifer came out of the shadows under the acacia tree and walked across the moonlight pavement toward him. Hey, mother of night, what is this? Gaboo gasped and fell back a few places, then straightened himself in anger. It is you, worthless one. Curse you. What do you mean coming upon me like that? I thought you were a gift. Gaboo, I want to talk to you. Please listen. Well, well, make haste. I'm tired. I want my mat. I, it, it's about the apprenticeship, Ronifer started to swallow. You will begin tomorrow and that is all I have to say about this apprenticeship. Do not waste your breath arguing. Nay, I will not. I do not mean to argue. I mean to, to tell you of a plan I have, one that will please you. Ronifer added quickly. Gabu grunted skeptically, but waited. You took me when my father went to the gods, began Ronifer carefully. Out of the, he swallowed but forced it out, out of the goodness of your heart. I, a gutter waif, if you had not offered me food and lodging, I would be sleeping in the dust of the streets and fighting the dogs for their leavings. Instead, I live comfortably on your bread and you found me work to my, your, you found me work to my liking and did not apprentice me to a fishmonger or, or yourself until now. I am a burden to you, a great burden. You've said so many times, have you not, Gabu? Ronifer cried, forgetting his speech for a moment in his emotion. Is it not true, all that I've said? Go on, Gabu said. Again, Ronifer swallowed. 
a great gulp to him, a great gulp to give him courage, then poured out the rest in a torrent for fear he would not get it all out. Therefore, I wish to take away the burden of myself. I will leave you and not live on your bread or sleep in your courtyard. Instead, I will buy my, build myself a little house in the desert out of bricks that I shall make myself. And I will cut pap papyrus in the marsh and sell it to the sail makers and buy my own bread and fish. And you will not need to trouble about me ever again any longer. And I can do this, all this, and never again be a burden to you. If only will, you will, you would, you will buy me a, a donkey, just one very small donkey to carry the papyrus to the sail makers. It need not be a young donkey, just an old one. I can give you coppers for it when I earn them. And he stopped because Gabu was laughing at first softly in little bursts, then louder, then in great gales, finally doubling over and then leaning back with his chin, tipped in the sky until the courtyard rang with it. And the neighbor across the wall flung back his lattice and began to curse at the noise. Still laughing, even staggering with the force of his laughter, Gabu moved on toward the stairway and up the steps to his room, leaving Ronifer standing silent in the moonlight. When the door of the upstairs room had creaked shut on its leather hinges and the left laughter had at least died away, Ronifer turned and walked slowly back to the acacia tree. The plan had not succeeded. He had not really in his heart ever thought it would. Whew. Well, what do you think uh, Gabu was laughing at? I kind of expected Gabu to get angry, but he was laughing. Do you think it's because of the donkey that he doesn't feel like he should buy him a donkey? Perhaps donkeys are more expensive than he thinks uh, Ronifer is worth? Or is he laughing because he has another plan and um, Ronifer is still going to need to work for him? Well, we'll see. Bye-bye.